Hello friends and welcome to the channel Rapid Revision of Orthopedics by Dr. Pratik Joshi. Now so far uh, in our channel what we have done is we have started covering general orthopedic topics such as uh, fracture healing or infections in orthopedics. Now in this series we will be starting about regional orthopedics and starting with the biggest joint of the body that is the hip joint. Now traumatology in the hip has a lot of components it has fracture head of femur some part of fracture acetabulum fracture intracapsular neck femur fracture intertrochantric so on and so forth so what we will be considering in this particular session is intertrochantric and intracapsular neck femur fractures now it is very difficult to finish both these fractures start to finish in a single session so what we will do is we will divide it into three sessions we will take the general considerations of intertrochantric as well as intracapsular in this session and we will stop at pathophysiology and biomechanics followed by that we will have a separate session on treatment of intercapsular and another session on treatment of intertrochantric fractures so couple of slides as usual may be a little theoretical a lot of text on the slide but this is a set of carefully curated keywords which we have compiled from standard orthopedic references so please feel free to screenshot them or even better to make notes and if you or anyone else has not subscribed to the channel please do subscribe and hit the bell icon so that as and when i upload a new topic it will be delivered directly to you so without any further ado let us first start off with what all are the fractures which you can encounter in the femur so right here Proximally, you can have fracture head of the femur, which is a pipkin fracture. Going a little distally, you can have a fracture neck of the femur at the junction of the head and the neck that is called as a subcapital fracture neck femur. Here, you can have a fracture at the base of the neck of femur, it is called as basi cervical. Between the two of them, you have a fracture line which is bang in the middle of the neck and therefore it is called as trans cervical fracture neck femur. Now, these three fracture lines come under intracapsular neck femur because the fracture line itself and the resultant hematoma will be constrained within the hip joint capsule. Now moving on, the fracture line or a fracture lying between the two trochanters, the lesser trochanter here and the greater trochanter here is said to be in the intertrochantric region and this intertrochantric fracture is also called an extracapsular fracture because the hematoma as well as the fracture line lies outside the hip joint capsule. Now under intertrochantric fractures you can have isolated fractures of greater trochanter as well and these are a separate clinical entity because of the attachment of gluteus medius and minimus to the tip of greater trochanter which are the main abductors of the hip joint. Moving on at the level of the lesser trochanter to about 5 cm below the level of lesser trochanter you have the subtrochantric zone and the fractures in this region are called as subtrochantric fractures. On a similar line, the area between the roof of the intercondylar fossa and about 5 cm above that is called as the supracondylar region giving rise to supracondylar fractures of the femur. The area below that are the separate condyles medial and lateral and the fractures are named likewise and the area between the subtrochantric region and the supracondylar region is called as the shaft and you can have upper one-third shaft, middle one-third shaft and distal one-third shaft of the femur. These are all the fractures which you can get around the hip joint. Now before we go on to the actual set of fractures, let us take a look at the attachment of the hip joint capsule. The hip joint capsule proximally is attached to the acetabular labrum and distally it attaches to the intertrochantric line on the anterior aspect of the proximal femur and it attaches to the intertrochantric crest on the posterior aspect of the proximal femur. So on the anterior aspect you have the hip joint capsule extending from acetabular labrum proximally to the intertrochantric line distally. On the posterior aspect you have the same hip joint capsule extending from the acetabular labrum proximally to the intertrochantric crest distally. Now a point to note here is that the attachment of the hip joint capsule is more distal anteriorly as compared to posteriorly which means anteriorly the hip joint capsule tends to provide more coverage to the hip joint as compared to posteriorly. Moving on, now we have to decide intertrochantric versus intracapsular 
the best way to learn these fractures is by comparison and contrasting. So starting with the age group and the epidemiology, the first and the most common age group for intertrochantric fractures is 70 to 80 years, which means seventh decade of life. The age group for intracapsular fractures as per literature is one decade younger than intertrochantric. So 60 to 70 years is the most common age group for intracapsular fractures. Moving on, mechanism of trauma in both these fractures is a low energy domestic fall, which means a history such as a fall in the bathroom or a fall while getting off the bed will be found. Now, going on to the site of the pain. Now, in case of intertrochantric fractures, the hematoma and the fracture line lies outside the hip joint capsule because of which the pain as well as everything else will be referred to the skin overlying it. So there will be pain at the skin and the area overlying the tip of greater trochanter and the lateral flange of greater trochanter. Also this being outside the hip joint capsule the fracture will be palpable through the overlying skin and therefore point tenderness at the lateral flange of greater trochanter will be found. Whereas in case of intracapsular neck femur fracture the neck femur itself being constrained within the hip joint capsule the pain will be a little on the medial side that is in the groin and on the medial aspect of the thigh this is for two reasons firstly because the pain would be on direct palpation of the neck of the femur secondly because of the fracture and the fracture hematoma distending the capsule the pain will be referred from the synovial capsule of the hip joint to the area of the skin innervated by the same nerve supply by the law of reciprocal innervation and that is the groin and the medial aspect of the thigh and therefore this pain will be because of the fracture pain plus because of the hematoma distending the joint capsule. Now contusions and physical findings such as reddening of the skin and swelling are more likely to be severe in intertrochantric as compared to intracapsular fractures because in case of intertrochantric fractures the fracture hematoma is not constrained by the hip joint capsule. Therefore, the blood is free to move between the compartments of the thigh and in the local area and it will pigment the skin above it causing local signs such as contusions. Whereas in case of intracapsular fractures, the hematoma being constrained by the hip joint capsule, it will not be free to travel around in the facial planes and therefore the amount of contusion and reddening will be far more in intertrochantric fracture than in intracapsular fracture. Moving on to the degree of pain with respect to physical findings. Now we have seen that intertrochantric fractures will have severe physical findings of contusions and reddening of the skin. However, one component which is absent in intertrochantric fracture which is present in intracapsular fractures is the pressure effect of an expanding hematoma against the joint capsule and therefore that will add to the pain in an intracapsular neck femur fracture and therefore in an intracapsular neck femur fracture the pain will be clinically more than the expected physical findings whereas in case of intertrochantric fracture the pain will be less with respect to the physical findings. Moving on in both these fractures the limb will be in a degree of external rotation. External rotation plus there will be a certain amount of shortening of the limb. Now degree of external rotation may vary from patient to patient but in theory intertrochantric fracture will have a greater degree of external rotation as compared to intracapsular fracture because in case of intracapsular fracture although the neck is fractured the limb is held in a slight degree of neutral to minimal external rotation by the presence of the intact joint capsule. Whereas in case of intertrochantric fracture where the fracture line is distal to the joint capsule, this effect is negated and there will be full external rotation of the affected limb in case of intertrochantric fractures. So a classical history or examination point in intertrochantric fractures is that the lateral aspect of the foot of the affected side lies in contact with the bed. That is a 90 degree of external rotation which is ideally seen in intertrochantric fractures. Moving on, which of these fractures are likely to go into malunion versus non-union? Now 
we will go into this at the time of complications but myelunion is more common in intertrochanteric fractures as compared to intracapsular fractures however intracapsular fractures are more likely to go into non-union as compared to intertrochanteric fractures also intracapsular fractures are at a higher risk of causing avascular necrosis as compared to intertrochanteric fractures now before we move on to the pathophysiology we should know the blood supply of the head of the femur so let's draw it the main artery supplying the head and neck of the femur is the femoral artery which gives a profunda femoris branch now profunda femoris branch divides into two branches that is the medial and lateral circumflex femoral artery medial and lateral circumflex femoral artery circle around the base of the neck of the femur and they form the extra capsular arterial ring of crock out of this the medial circumflex femoral artery gives 75 percent of the blood supply and lateral circumflex femoral artery gives about 25 percent now this arterial ring extra capsular arterial ring gives ascending intracapsular branches four groups of ascending intracapsular branches that is anterior posterior medial and lateral ascending intracapsular arteries now these arteries ascend the neck of the femur towards the head of the femur and out of these four branches it is the lateral ascending intracapsular branch which now carries 75 percent of the total blood supply of course these arteries are not just parallel to each other but they connect to each other via anastomosis and together they form the network of blood vessels around the neck of the femur and this is called as retinaculum so these arteries are also called as the ascending or the retinacular arteries now reaching towards the base of the head of the femur these arteries come together and they form another ring that is the intracapsular subsynovial arterial ring of chunk now this arterial ring provides branches into the head of the femur which supply about 75 percent of the head of the femur these ascending branches are called as intra cervical ascending branches of troita now the remaining 25 percent of the head of the femur receives a blood supply from a completely different source that is the ligamentum teres artery or the foveal branch of the obturator artery which inserts near the fovea centralis and provides the 25 percent parafoveal area which is near the apex of the head so a quick revision of blood supply of the head and neck of the femur profunda femoris artery giving ascending branches of medial and lateral circumflex femoral artery in a 3 is to 1 ratio they give the extracapsular arterial anastomosis of croc they will give the ascending intracapsular branches lateral medial anterior and posterior out of which lateral now has 75 percent of the blood supply now these will anastomose with each other and they will form the retinaculum now all of these will get together and form the intracapsular subsynovial ring of chung which will provide the ascending cervical vessels of troita and this will provide about 75 percent and the remaining 25 percent will come out of the ligamentum teres artery or the foveal branch of obturator artery now moving on to the epidemiology you have a bimodal age peak in these fractures now on the y-axis here if you have the incidence of intracapsular intertrochanteric fractures and in case of the x-axis you have the age of the patient so you get one peak in young patients and you get another peak in elderly patients please note how i have made the young patients peak less than the elderly because even if you have a bimodal age peak the number of elderly patients in their sixth and seventh decade grossly outnumbers the number of patients in their young age group moving on in young patients the most common mechanism is a high energy trauma such as a fall from a height or a high speed road traffic accident in young in elderly patients you will have a low energy trauma such as a domestic fall or a fall in the bathroom now there are certain reasons why old patients suffer fractures around the neck of the femur more commonly than young patients the first is because of age they lose out on the protective reflexes so if you and i were to fall on the floor we would probably put our hands out to protect us which the elderly person cannot do fast enough before they hit the floor and therefore the loss of protective reflexes 
exposes their hip joint to direct trauma of the fall. Second is that in case of elderly people, there is a less amount of muscular, fatty and cutaneous padding to the bony prominences such as tip of greater trochanter as compared to a young patient. Third, elderly patients are probably more likely to have cognitive and balance dysfunctions such as Parkinsonism, Alzheimer's disease and senile dementia. And fourth is that in an elderly patient, the bone stock is likely to be less because of postmenopausal osteoporosis in females and senile osteoporosis in both the genders and therefore old patients are more susceptible to low energy trauma leading to fractures around the hip as compared to young patients. The most common mechanism as we saw is a low energy trauma and the most common history is a domestic fall at home. Now mortality is very high in case of elderly patients more in case of intertrochantric as compared to intracapsular and the rate of mortality is not just due to the fracture but also because of the associated complications and the complications of immobilization such as bed sores, pneumonia and thromboembolic phenomena and this highlights the importance of post-operative physiotherapy and early mobilization in such fractures. Now outcomes depend upon the degree of complications. Uh, there is avascular necrosis, there is malunion, there is non-union and standard Harris hip score can be used to objectively gauge the outcome. Now a couple of classifications to be learned. The first is the Boyd and Griffin classification for intertrochantric neck femur. The first type 1 is a stable intertrochantric fracture which is just two part proximal and distal fragment. Now a type 2 is a type 1 with a main fracture line along the intertrochantric line but with comminution in variable planes. Type 3 is a reverse oblique fracture. Now a reverse oblique is called a reverse oblique because in all other variants of intertrochantric fracture, the fracture line progresses from superolateral to inferomedial. Superolateral here to inferomedial here. Whereas if you can see in the reverse oblique pattern, it progresses from superomedial to inferolateral which means the direction is the opposite and this is the most unstable fracture and reverse oblique fracture is an absolute indication for surgery. Also type 4 in Boyd and Griffin is an intertrochantric fracture with a subtrochantric extension in more than one plane. There is another classification called an Evans classification. Evans type 1 is an undisplaced simple two part intertrochantric fracture. Evans type 2 is a displaced two-part intertrochantric fracture. Evans type 3 is a type 1 or a type 2 with comminution at the greater trochanter. This is important because this may cause avulsion fracture of the greater trochanter to which the gluteus medius and other hip abductors are attached. Moving on, type 4 and type 5 have one thing in common that is lesser trochanter fracture along with privation or breakage of the calcar femoral. Now the inferomedial calcar femoral is the most thick and the most important weight bearing structure of the hip and therefore a fracture to the calcar femoral will reduce the stability and the patient will have to be immobilized for variable period after surgery. And type 5 is a type 4 with comminution of the greater trochanter. Till some years ago Evans classification ended here at type 5 but a new classification has been added where Evans type R refers to a reverse oblique fracture with the fracture line traveling from the superomedial aspect to the inferior lateral aspect in the reverse direction. Moving on for intracapsular fractures, garden classification is used. Garden type 1 is a partial fracture in valgus impaction. Garden type 2 is a complete fracture which is non-displaced. Garden type 3 is a complete fracture which is partially displaced and garden type 4 is a complete fracture which is completely displaced. Now we have another two classifications based on the angle of the fracture line. So first is a Powell classification which refers to the angle of the fracture line with respect to the horizontal. So Powell A will be a fracture which is around 30 degrees from the horizontal, Powell B will be around 50 degrees and Powell C will be around 70 degrees from the horizontal. We have a Purlington classification which again gives you the angulation of the fracture line with respect to the vertical. 
so powell a uh, purlington a will be 30 degrees from the vertical purlington b will be 50 degrees from the vertical and purlington c will be about 70 degrees from the vertical we should always remember the rule of 30 50 70 also what actually matters is not whether it's a powell a or a powell c or a purlington a or a purlington c the concept to be grasped over here is that a fracture line which is more horizontal is less likely to re-displace when the patient bears weight vertically downwards. On the contrary, in a more horizontal fracture line, as the patient bears weight, there will be compression of the fracture fragments on top of each other and the healing will be better. Whereas, in case of a more vertical fracture line, let us see this again. In case of a more vertical fracture line, as the patient bears weight vertically downwards, the proximal fragment and the distal fragment are likely to displace from each other and therefore outcomes are likely to be worse as the fracture line is more vertical as compared to when the fracture line is more horizontal. Also another difference between Garden's classification and Powell's classification is that in case of Garden's classification, this is a classification which can be applied in the emergency room when the patient is in front of you whereas Powell's and Purlington's both are classifications to be applied in the operation theatre after the fracture has been reduced and the final position of the fracture line can be seen and therefore in terms of emergency and in terms of damage control orthopedics garden classification is a classification which can be used rapidly and on the field that is the difference between garden versus the other two now we'll just take a brief look at the management in case of intracapsular fractures the management first starts with reduction there are a set of reduction maneuvers followed by which there is a fixation with the choice of implant maybe cancellous uh, screws maybe dynamic hip screw or any other uh, implant in case of intertrochantric fractures the management first depends on the choice of the implant and second is from the manner of fixation. Now we will not go into detail about this in this particular session because we will have a separate session each for intertrochantric management and intracapsular management. So just take a brief look at the complications. This too we will deal with at the end of the management. Malunion is more common with intertrochantric fractures as compared to intracapsular. Non-union is more common with intracapsular as compared to intertrochantric. Implant failure is a function of the rigidity of the fixation and the compliance of the patient postoperatively and that will be dealt with at the end of intertrochantric fractures. Infection and avascular necrosis are also complications related to these. Avascular necrosis is much more common after intracapsular fractures as compared to intertrochantric fractures. So this was the basic general considerations regarding fractures around the hip joint. So please do get in touch with me. My contact email is in the channel information. You can hit me up on Facebook or Instagram and you can leave comments to let me know how you liked it. And of course, please subscribe, like, share and hit the bell icon so that next time I say something, it will reach you directly. Thank you. Have a nice day.